Thank you so much for joining us. Today is a Good Friday solemn service. We are here to exalt and remember what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary. So let us worship Him and adore Him. Hallelujah. Let's all stand to our feet and worship Him. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we come before Your presence, O oh God. What an awesome privilege you have granted us to come before your throne and remember your good works at the cross of Calvary. That day reflected the greater remark in the history of mankind more than the crea creation day. A day that transformed mankind. A day that gave hope for mankind. But today, we come before with the adoration and understanding. You are the center, source of hope for mankind. Lord, today, each and every families who are gathered here, every children to the seniors, I pray, Lord, that your revelation of your truth be seen. Let this not be a mundane ritual or a traditional festival. Let it be a meaningful worship unto you. Let faith may arise in this place. Open our eyes to see your greater glory, O God. The love of the Father. The great sacrifice of the Son, Jesus Christ. The continuous work of the Holy Spirit. Continue to resonate in our hearts, O God. Today, have your way in this place. In spite of our busyness of life, Lord, help us to put aside everything that stands in the way, but give you complete attention to seek you and to experience your power and wonders in our life. Let your salvation continue to spring in our hearts. Have your way in us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. We're going to turn to a passage in the scripture. More than 500 years before Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, prophets have spoken. There is a promised Messiah will be coming. Today we're going to reflect on the one of the prophets who spoke about the great message. It's from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1 through 3. I'm going to read. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like no one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Today as a church, as the worship team come forward. Today we as a children of God, it is a day of redemption. If you're, this is your first day or you're familiar with being in the church. Today is the day God showed it as a remembrance of God's act towards mankind. It's a special day for mankind. So today we reflect our hearts before God and say, Lord, let your plan shall continue to prevail in my heart. Let us worship Him, that God continue to minister to us in a meaningful way, and God continue to lead us.
and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth.
hearts the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors.
God saw us. God loved us. And counted us one of His. He didn't come for any other selfish reason. He selflessly became one of us. Today He is the lover of our soul. Let's sing the chorus again. Jesus Messiah. Sing it from your heart. Let's worship Him. Let us surrender our hearts before Him and say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life today. Reveal yourself to me.
want to dismiss our children, they're going to spend some time with us. Yeah, what is this? Let's turn to God's word together. John chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. You want to understand what I'm talking about? You want to understand what I'm talking about? The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Today we are going to just quickly view a video and uh, then we'll get to the message. And some of them is a 
new hope and they remembering the possible taken to heaven. And some of them remember this as a time the world celebrates year after year. And some of them, the unbelievers, the merchants, they use this season to make money. Some of them are skeptics. They're wondering why some people are making a big deal about this man called Jesus who came 2,000 years before. Today we're going to see a perspective from three different people. Three different perspectives. And if you have your name, John, please don't get offended. So we are today, we are going to look at the three John. In America, there's a, in English, there's a famous saying in American culture, it says that John means that the first that can, it is so likable name, Brother John Andrew, please don't offend, get offended. Very likable name. So they chose the name John for various things. I don't want to define the John for how many things, but some are good things that some of the area, like even if you find an unidentified man or if you find or something going to happen for somebody, they don't want to announce the name, they call it John Doe. Okay? So today, what is John Doe's perspective about Jesus during the special time? When before, all through the Christmas or Easter or Good Friday time, if you look at the History Channel or Discovery Channel, many other channels, that they show about the season, about, they give importance to various things. Sometimes they sit and talk about the nail they probably used to pierce Jesus' hand. They probably, they talk about in lengthy fashion, they talk about the hammer that probably used or the relic that we seen in that place or the tomb. They talk about so many things when they remember this season. What do you remember this season? How does this season be a special season in your life and my life? Many come for various reasons during this time to remember Jesus. Here John, that is the perspective of the John Doe in the world. He's probably some, some great man, a historian, or a religious man, or it is a, a Jewish thing, or a Christian thing, or it might be some for people who do not have any other better things to do. That is some of the John Doe's perspective about Jesus. Today we're going to look at some other perspective. The next person we're going to look at is John the Baptist. That's the verse we just read, John the Baptist. He said, who is this man? John the Baptist, if you want to talk about John the Baptist, we want to talk a little bit about him. He is not just an ordinary man. His father was a Jewish leader. He was a priest. He grew up learning the laws of Judaism. The laws given through the book of Moses. He learned and studied, well-studied man through his father. And he was a, he was a, his father's parents were God-fearing people. So he comes from a great family of heritage. And so people respect him, John the Baptist. And as you study about John the Baptist, he is a man who is not a wimp. He is a bold and strong man. And he was, in the young age, he dedicated himself for God's work. John the Baptist was so considered as a righteous man. He was considered as a prophet also. He spoke God's word profoundly to the times and seasons. And also, he had a great popularity. Wherever he went, people followed him as a great prophet. And many religious leaders, even though they saw and know the heritage he had, they were fearful of him because of the things he spoke and the knowledge he had. And he might become a great, another great leader. Some even counted him as a possible messiah. So they came to John the Baptist and asked him, John the Baptist, who do you think, what, what are you doing? What is your purpose of your visit to this world? What is the purpose of your ministry? How can we follow you? How can we enhance this? How can we know you more and know the plans of God in a greater detail? John the Baptist said, I'm not the Messiah. And he continued to speak God's word and encourage people. He baptized the people in water. That's when he saw 
Jesus coming through that way towards Jordan. And he told people, he wasn't afraid to tell the truth. Because people were waiting for this Messiah. He didn't wrongfully take the title. Many in this world take the title in their hand for various reasons. But John the Baptist understood his plans and purpose. He, he said, look, this man is the one you're waiting for. His name is Jesus. He is the Lamb of God. Everybody say Lamb of God. Lamb of God. It is not just an ordinary title. As a Jew, it is one of the remarkable titles in their life. We have to look at the three ways. If you're taking notes, you can, you can take notes about this. What is the Lamb of God? It is ingrained in their culture and religious and hope for Jewish believers. It reflected three major areas. First of all, it, it mentioned in Genesis and creation, when man fell into sin, God said God will restore mankind through the sacrifice through of, man, of a man child who is going to be born. He will crush the head of the Satan. And Genesis 3.15 talks about that. And secondly, it talks about a great sacrifice as a lamb for personal redeemer. If you look at Genesis chapter 22 verse 8, Abraham, he is the father of Judaism, father of their belief. Abraham trusted God. When he trusted God, God tested him. When he tested him, he asked, God asked him to sacrifice his son. During this time, it says uh, in Genesis chapter 22 verse 8, it says, Abraham answered while they were walking in the journey to sacrifice his son. He has only one son. God asked even that son to show the obedience, to show the complete trust in the Lord. Abraham is taking the one and only son who is the promised son for promised child who is the answer for God's promise to him to the and in that moment also he trusted God and taking while taking the son to obey God's call Isaac is asking him father we have wood we traveled such a long ways this many days I've seen other sacrifices but where is the lamb I'm a teenage boy daddy are you tricking me or are we going any other trip? Abraham on one hand, he has, he understood God is faithful, God is true, God is trustworthy, but this is not a joke for him. He is on and worldly, the blood of his, his own. He loved him dearly so much, he would do anything to save his son. That point, Without reluctance. Do you know what Abraham said? Can somebody read that verse please? Genesis chapter 22 verse. Abraham answered. Abraham answered. God himself will provide the lamb for the first offering. Okay. Sometimes we pass through. It says God himself will provide. It is let us pause there. It says God himself will provide the lamb. God himself. Today let us remember the word himself. It is not just an additional thing God, God will, God did not provide some, another ransom sacrifice for you and me. Let us, as we continue to study this, discover this, God himself will provide. Everybody say, God himself will provide. Brothers and sisters, today, Abraham, that day he understood the value of trusting this God, Jehovah. Even though he has not seen him with his naked eye, even though his precious son is asked for, he still trusts this God and he said, I don't know all the details in my life, but I can trust in this God. God himself will provide for me. That kind of trust and understanding he had. My brothers and sisters, what is our understanding about God today? Do we trust God in all our life? Our wealth and strength, do we trust God in every aspect? Here, Abraham's every possession is based upon this child. 
Every joy is based on this child. Every hope is based upon this child. In that moment, that child is being tested to take it away. Abraham trusts God. He says, you know what? God himself will provide for me, for us. That is the, that's why today we call him, even thousands of years later, we call him father of faith. Even though he had his weakness, he had his uncertainty moment, he had his failures, he trusted God completely. My brothers and sisters, do we trust God? Do we believe that God is our answer to the core things we are tested in in every aspect? The Bible says he's not a man to lie. They even point to him. He's not a man to change his mind. Manamara and Manuputra na lai. Our Sulliyam Sayyadir Paro. Our Vasanitam Ravetra Dir Paro. He fulfilled his word in timely manner. Today, that's the kind of God we say. Well, let's clap our hands and thank the Lord. He's our changing God. That's why Abraham said, God himself will provide. He not only he understood that day, the answer for mankind, his need, is God himself will provide physical, practical land, but he prophesied towards the, his generation. He said, you know what? Our hope, God will provide. God himself will be one of God, one day he will become one of us. He himself will be a ransom sacrifice before you and me. He foresaw beyond anybody else could see. Secondly, if you look at in that same topic of John's perspective and, and this Jewish people when they called, when they looked upon the Lamb of God, he says, secondly, so first one is a personal great, greatest sacrifice as a Lamb for personal Redeemer. Second of all, freedom for those who are under slavery under as a Passover Redeemer. First of all, as a personal Redeemer. God was faithfully shown to their forefather through Abraham. Second of all, as a Passover Redeemer. Many of us know the story. Israelites for 400 years were under the tyranny of slavery of Egyptian King Pharaoh for 400 years. They were slave. Every day was a nightmare. They had a great promise. They were called the children of the living God. But every day was a pain and suffering. Some of you and I, we go through trials. Sometimes we even question, Lord, do you really exist? Do you hear me? Does somebody out there who knows my challenge? For 400 years, they cried upon the God of their fathers. In the due time, God redeemed them. That moment, God did attend mighty miracles. The final one was the last call for Pharaoh. What did God do? It's a Passover. Passover means a death angel will come in that place. One of the only thing God asked the Israelites, his children to do is sacrifice an unblemished lamb. Unblemished lamb. Sacrifice this lamb. And what did God ask them to do? You can talk to me. What did God ask them to do? Eat the lamb? Yes, he did ask them to eat too, but they ate. What else he asked? Something important. If your family need to be preserved, if your family need to be protected, if your firstborn needs to be protected, what do you need to do? You post the blood of the lamb in your doorpost. You apply the blood of the lamb in your doorpost. Then only your family will be protected. Your firstborn will be protected. It is very important. It is not just cutting the lamb is important. Not eating the lamb is important. It is important those who obey God and posted the blood of the lamb in the doorpost. Then only the death angel will pass through, will protect their family, their firstborn. That is the mark between a believer, a Jew, and a Je an Egyptian in that place. Those who posted their 
the blood of the Lamb were protected that day. God redeemed them with a mighty hand. That's why they celebrate this, uh, this time called Passover. Passover was a meaningful moment in their life. God redeemed the Jewish under the tyranny. They were for, under the uh, hardship for 40, 400 years. God redeemed them with a mighty hand and preserved them to have a name for them. All through the gener generations, they have to remember how God has redeemed them. Every day, every moment, the Jewish parents who teach their children, you are not just alone, you are a child of the living God. They had a hope. They had a story to tell how God was real among them. God set them free from the tyranny of their king. God is a redeemer. He wants to give freedom to his children. Third thing is, is a prophetic redeemer. In Isaiah, let's turn to Isaiah. It's so not only he was a Passover redeemer. Third thing is, give freedom. He is a sinless lamb of God through perfect prophetic area. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6 and 8. This was 500 years before Jesus came to this earth. It says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own ways. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Here, Isaiah prophet, Isaiah prophet Isaiah, he's talking about there will be, the Son of Man will come. He will be like a lamb that will be slaughtered. All through the Jewish mind, in their perspective, when John the Baptist tells them, look, here is the Lamb of God, they understood what the true Lamb means. All these things goes, they're waiting with the message. When will this Messiah will come to redeem us? How many times God has reminded our generation, our mankind, His great work. So this is what, when John the Baptist say, there is, look, there's a Lamb of God is coming. They were shocked that he is not taking the claim. He's pointing out to an uncommon man called Jesus. John the Baptist continued to say, you know what? I'm not worthy even to untie his shoes. And he says, he must increase, I must decrease. He understood the greater purpose of this promised Messiah. Is it, not, is it I am not the light, and the one who speaks about this light? He understood his purpose and the hope Jesus brings to this world. Third thing is, first of all, we talked about John Doe. Second of all, we talked about John the Baptist. Third of all, we're going to look at the perspective of John the Apostle. Apostle Tom, John, he is one of the disciples. Disciples, let's turn to Revelation. He had a perspective. What was John the, uh, John the Apostle's perspective? Can somebody read chapter 5, verse 5 through 9, please? Can somebody read Revelation chapter 5, verse 5 through 9? Revelation. For one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, mm -hmm. having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the world, earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Mm -hmm. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And 
they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Amen. John had a great revelation. It is not just a king died for their people. It is not just an ordinary man dying. He understood this lamb, this, their master Jesus, their, their guru, their leader Jesus is not just an ordinary man. He saw a vision. Heaven rose up. The elders rose up to worship the lamb of God. They worshiped and said, he is the lamb of God. Worthy is his name. Heaven stood when Jesus walked into that place because no one is worthy to receive the scroll. Well, no one is worthy. It shows that no one is righteous in the sight of God. When the call was made for mankind's judgment, nobody can stand and say, I am righteous before God. Bible says our righteousness is like a filthy rag. Even though we have so many good people in this world, that many has said the great things, many have given so many like a great philanthropists, but nobody's righteous, everybody's righteousness in the sight of God is like a filthy rag. We are sinners, the sight of the sinless God. That's why God Himself has to become one of us to die for you and me as a ransom sacrifice. God understood this. That's why it says, the Bible says, before the foundation of the earth, the world, He was slain for you and me. It was determined for you and me before the foundation of the earth. God knew this is going to happen. That doesn't mean it happened again. He knew He's a sovereign God. He at the same time, He has given free will for mankind. He didn't want to twist man's hand. Man's hand. He gave free will and created Him in His image. My brothers and sisters, God loves you, each and every one of you. He made you in His image. We are sinners who lost the image of God because of our disobedience. Because God so loved us so much, that's why He came to this world. It was not a pleasure for Him. He left the heavenly realm to become one of us as a human being. He bore the pain. He bore the suffering. He endured everything to show the love of God. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, the day of before, the night before he was being betrayed, he was weeping to the Father. The agony and the pain he is going to bore, he understood what the task ahead of him is going to be like. But yet, the Bible says, he willingly surrendered as a lamb that is going to be slaughtered. Pilate stood before his throne and he said, you know what? We couldn't find any false at you. But I have the power to give you this physical freedom. Jesus didn't say a single word to Pilate because Jesus understood the power does not come from Pilate. It comes from Almighty God who planned from the ages before for that purpose he, made. he came to this earth. Today, my brothers and sisters, 2,000 years later, we are not remembering Pilate for his work. We are remembering Jesus. Many kings come and go. Many philosophers come and go. One man transformed the nature of mankind's life. And gave eternal hope is the name of Jesus. Is the Lamb of God who washed away our sins. That's why a songwriter wrote this way. Even though it is a painful reminder of what Christ went through. But we call it Good Friday. It's kind of oxymoron. Like, you know, it's like when you call something good, why are you remembering something bad? Because what Christ, unless Christ went through, go through that, you and I will not have a good life. Can I get a man? We will not have a good hope. Even though because of one man's sacrifice, we became joyful. 
because of one man laying in the cross of Calvary, we found freedom. Can I get a man? He was afflicted for you and me. That's why Isaac Watts, he writes here, he says, Oh, the wonderful cross. Cross used to be a symbol of pain, shame, and agony. But he writes, Oh, the wonderful cross. Oh, the wonderful cross. Bids me come and die and find that I may truly live. Oh, the wonderful cross. Oh, the wonderful cross. All who gathered here by grace draw near and bless his name. He continues to write this story. How marvelous, how wonderful is this cross. Today we carry this symbol in our neck, carry this, exchange this symbol as a unique symbol in our life. We have that in our stage. It is not just the actual cross itself, it is the act of God that transformed, it is the heart of God that redeemed us. One of the interesting things is, the world looks at it in a perspective, if a king wants to redeem, he will come in the image of something glamorous to show the power and awesomeness. Do you understand? The great God of heavens and the earth who made all the galaxies and beyond, he didn't send his son as a lion. He sent him as a lamb that is going to be slaughtered. It showed the humility and the love and the passion he had for you and me. Anybody could think of a lion that can come and redeem. A lamb, anybody can relate to and say, you know what, I can associate with a lamb because that is a flimsy animal. That is not always considered as a majestic thing, but it is like always considered as a prey. God chose that humbleness of lamb to be slaughtered for you and me. In humility, he redeemed us. He became nothing so that we become everything. He became nothing so that we, become, we can have eternal life. Today, my brothers and sisters, if you think of something that you have made great sacrifice, our sacrifice is nothing compared to what God sacrificed for you and me. He doesn't have to do this, but he did it willingly because he loved us so much. Today, as we continue to remember God's work, as we're going to close this service with the communion, one thing I want to talk to you about is that as the Israelites, even though the call was given to them, to slaughter the lamb, Passover lamb. It is up to the, each individuals to obey the call that was given to them, to post the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. In order for them to obey, there needs to be a faith that needs to be seen in their life. We don't know all of the children of Israel obeyed that day. Definitely the Egyptians would have heard this rumor. They probably laughed about them. Today, my brothers and sisters, many people are laughing about you. What are you doing? Why are you worshiping this Jesus? He didn't seem like a very prosperous man. At the end, prime age, he was killed. When you talk about Jesus, it's all about it's a lot of suffering and agony and pain. You think about my brothers and sisters today, do you have faith in this man Jesus? He's just not an ordinary man. We, even 2,000 years later, we're talking about him. That's the man John saw in his vision as a Lamb of God. Today, it is not just, we are remembering just another incident. This is an incident that transformed our life. Transform the mankind's life, given us a great hope. As we are going to partake as the worship team come, comes forward, we are going to partake the communion together. It is not about 
what you're growing, what you grew up with, the tradition you had. It's not about what kind of name we possess, what we know that much in the past. Today, do you have faith in this Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who died for your sin and my sin? Today, do you completely surrender yourself to Him in obedience? We heard about what does the Holy John say? We heard about what does the John the Baptist say? We heard what does John the Apostle say? Today, my brothers and sisters, God is asking you, who do you say I am in your life? Is your master? Is your ruler of your life? Is he a lamb that victoriously won your heart? Let's close our eyes as we hear the worship songs as the communion emblems being passed. Actually, we're not going to pass the communion emblems today. We're going to do it a little different way. Just so you can come. We're going to continue to sing and worship. We want you to be in the presence of God. It's between you and God. You pray to God, make a dedication. Once you're ready, I'm going to be here. I'm going to give you the communion. You can come forward. And you can go back. We're going to continue to sing the song. And we want you to. It is the time between you and your maker. You and your savior. As the Holy Spirit continues to speak into your heart. Let us not take it lightly. If you want to forgive somebody to ask God to show your obedience and repentance before the before the Lord today you can do so don't do this as as a religious sake don't do this because it's just a good Friday do this because you understand what does it mean to follow Christ do this because God loves you and you love God with all your heart, with all your mind. Do this with faith. Do this with understanding that you are a child of the living God. And you have hope in Him. So let's take a moment as the music being played and sung behind the scene. Let's not be distracted. Let's take a moment. Reflect our life before the throne of God. And remember, Lord, let this day, day be a meaningful day for you, O oh God. Lord, let your work and the purpose of the cross, let it embed in my heart. Have your way in me, Jesus.